church is a celebration. It really is. It's a celebration, right? Like, I love sports. You know, some of you like sports. And I tell you, when my team is playing, I'm into it, right? Some of your team was playing yesterday or your team's going to play today. And, man, you sit on the edge of your seat, you know, and you're ready to go. You got the volume, the kids, get away from me. Daddy's watching the game, you know. And you got the popcorn, you got the wings, you're ready to go. And, man, somebody scores a touchdown, touchdown, ah, you know. When my team is playing, I'm a college football fan. And when my team is playing, Michigan Wolverines is my team. And if you're an Ohio State Buckeye fan, I apologize for you. And you can, uh, you can find a wonderful church. No, I'm just joking. No, I'm just, we're glad you're here. We welcome all folks here today. But uh, when my team, my wife has one rule when, when my team is playing. She goes, just don't yell, okay? Just don't yell. I don't mind if you get excited. Just don't yell. And I can't help myself, you know, because I want to yell. I want to get excited because it's celebration. I'll tell you, if I can get excited, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad for getting excited for a football game, but I will say this. If I can get excited about a couple of guys running a ball down the field. And I'll tell you, on Sunday, I'm going to be doubly excited about the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. He is on the throne. He's in control. And God is good. And I can come to my uh, house here and I can worship the Lord. And so I'm going to get a little excited here. I know sometimes, you know, people say, I'll make you a little nervous, but you're energetic. I'm energetic for a reason because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of me and he has given me new life and a new direction. And I'm not going to sit down and be like, yeah, kind of Jesus kind of changed my life. No, sir. I'm excited about the fact that God is doing something, that God is working, that God has brought us through a pandemic, a, a year that no one expected, and yet here we are preaching the word of God, man, excited about God's uh, things, and looking forward to the future. Hey, I'm a little bit excited about it, so excuse me on Sunday if you see me walking around a little bit and got some air under my, under my shoes, because man, I'll tell you, God is working. I still believe that God can do great things, and we're seeing him do great things, and so Welcome to Sunday. We get a little excited around here about, about what God is doing. And so if you want to get excited, maybe it's not your personality. I understand. Everybody is different, all right? Not everybody's, uh, you know, outgoing. I struggle sometimes with being outgoing. No, I'm just joking. That's not true at all. Uh, I love uh, outgoing and, and, be, and meeting people. But if that is you, you just kind of, you know, say amen under your mask, and well, that'll be fine, too. And nod your head. Let me know you're with me today. Are you with me, church? If you are, say amen. Come on now. Amen. All right, good. Galatians chapter number three. In your Bible, Galatians chapter number three, and we're going to continue our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Galatians, and we're going to look at uh, the verse, uh, first couple of verses in chapter number three. We've been going verse-by-verse -verse through this, and I'm excited. So by way of review, I know, I know the school is out, but we're going to be in school just for a minute. We're going to go through review here because we've gone through chapter one gone through chapter 2, where Paul is talking to these Galatian believers, these believers who were Jews, who were converted, Gentiles who were converted, and he's telling them that, listen, you don't have to follow the law anymore. Jesus Christ came, the gospel has set us free from the law. The problem was, was that there were false teachers coming into the church telling people that, no, you can get saved by grace, but now you've got to follow the law as well. You have to do both. And Paul threw a fit about this because he said, that is not the gospel. As a matter of fact, it's a gospel that's not another. It's a false gospel, chapter number one. And he writes this letter to these Galatians to let them know that the gospel is enough, that we don't have to have all of these rules and regulations that keep us bound to religion, that we are free in Christ. So he writes in this letter, and then in the letter, he starts talking about and naming some people like Peter, who kind of was like a two-face. He was one way with the Jews, another way with the Gentiles, and he, he goes to him, and he approaches Peter, and he says, no, you're leading these people astray. Man, we're Jews. God has saved us, and if we don't need the law and we're Jewish, why do these Gentiles need the law. They're not even Jewish. They don't, the law doesn't even pertain to them. They're, they're not even uh, captive to the law. And so if we're not having had the law, why do they? Why are you teaching this? And so finally, he kind of sets it up now. And he set the foundation so that we know what the gospel is. It's the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know the purpose of the gospel is to set us free from the law so we can't work our way to heaven or be good enough because nobody can be good enough and no one is able to uh, uh, attain heaven through the law. And then now he finally turns in chapter 3 to the people themselves. He's, he he kind of talks to the false teachers, chapter 1. He talks to Peter. He talks to some other people. And now he turns to the church itself and begins to instruct them on how and why they were willing to follow the law when they were given the gospel. Verse number 1 of Galatians chapter number 3, it says this. It says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. 
He starts out here and he says, listen, he goes, I want to talk to you directly. I've talked to Peter. I set him straight. I made it clear what the gospel is. I've talked to the false teachers and I've let them know you're not going to preach this gospel anymore. But now I've got to talk to you because I have a heart for you and I want to see you grow in your Christian faith. And he's very direct with them. Oh, foolish Galatians. You know what I love about this? That even though it was kind of a harsh, direct uh, kind of rebuke towards, uh, from Paul, I think the reason why he was able to do that was because he had a close relationship with these people. He knew them. He was intimate with them. He had invested in them. There was accountability towards them. And so he had a close relationship with them. So he was able to share with them directly. He didn't have to beat around the bush. He didn't have to, you know, kind of like, you know, taper it. He didn't do one minute manager. Some of you know what that is. One minute manager. He didn't say, oh, you guys are doing great. And I love your house. And you look great. That's a nice shirt you got on. And now let me tell you, you're foolish for believing the law. Oh, and by the way, you're going to do great as we move on. He didn't do one minute manager on them. He came out right away and said, listen, there's something wrong in your life. There's something that needs to be dealt with. And as a friend and as someone who loves you, I'm going to come directly to you. I don't know about you. I'm thankful for people who are willing to speak directly into my life to help me become a better person. I am. I'm thankful for the relationships that I have where people are willing to not just let me go and do my thing and let me just go off and do, and do what I want, but they're willing to speak truth into my life. The Bible says this. It says faithful are the what? The wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Somebody walk up to you and they start telling you how great you are, how awesome you are, and how perfect you are. I might watch out for that person, right? Because you never know. That, that person, the person sometimes that loves you the most is the one that will hurt you, hurt you the most sometimes. Oh, you're great. You're wonderful. Hey, give me a friend, somebody who says, hey, listen, I see something in your life. I see something going on in your life, and I'm not going to let you go because I love you enough to tell you the truth. I remember when I was really overweight. Some of you don't know this, but uh, I used to weigh 440 pounds. I've got pictures. If you don't believe me, I'll show them to you after the service. I used to weigh 440 pounds. So it was basically me and then another me. All right? That's what kind of this. So let me see. This is what it looked like. This is what I look like right here. It was me and another me kind of thing, right? And I was a big, big man, big man. I, I, I enjoyed uh, food, and I enjoyed eating food a lot. Somebody asked me one time, remember it was funny, uh, we were, I was playing a round of golf with somebody, and you know, when you're that big, sometimes people just, they, they don't know what to say to you, you know what I mean? Because like, they kind of like, what do you talk about? Especially if they're doing like a, if they're like telling you about your work, their workout routine, that's always the most embarrassing thing, when like I was like in a conversation, right? And they're like, yeah, you know, I'm doing this new diet, new workout routine, and, and I'm just like, oh yeah, cool, man. Like, and y you're waiting for them to say, do you want to know what it is? Do you want, you know, you want some details about that or whatever? I remember one time, one guy said, he goes, now, do you eat meat? He asked me this. And I looked at him. I said, I said no. I said, I, I eat salad. I just eat a lot of salad. No meat at all. But I was a big guy. I was 440 pounds. Man, I, I wear a 5X shirt. I, uh, I had a, a, my pant size was, I think I got up to like 58 pant size, right? And uh, I was a short guy, too. So I'm a 58, like, and my length is 28. So it was like, I was like, like square pants, basically. And... And I'll tell you, I would eat and eat, and my wife would lovingly, lovingly, my wife, my beautiful wife, Becky, she would constantly try to, you know, help me and encourage me. We'd have these morning talks, uh, and we would, and I'd walk out, you know, and get ready to go out to the office, and she'd say, is today going to be the day? And that meant, like, are you going to start, like, you know, stop doing, you're going to start exercising? And I'm like, no. I was like, I'll, I used to say, I'll die when God wants me to die, you know, and I'm not a minute sooner. That's what I used to say. But my wife would care about me. And I remember as I, I started a journey, a weight loss journey, back January uh, 1st of 2018. And so it's been, it'll be three years here next week that I've been on this weight loss journey. I've lost about 220 pounds or so. Uh, and I praise the Lord for that. It's all, it's all God's glory. But it's funny to me that when I lost all of that weight, the number of people that came up to me after I lost the weight and they said, man, you know, you look good and really happy for you. Man, I was real concerned about you. And I thought, but you never said anything. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, I was, man, I'll tell you, I was really praying for you, man. I would, you know, I would see you walk around, and I'd be like, man, that guy's going to have a heart attack. He's, man, I'll tell you, someone's got to help that guy. I got to, and I would, and I thought to myself, well, but you, but I've known you for 10 years. You know I've been big. You never said one time to me. Yeah, you got to do something about that weight. 
See, to me, there's a lot of people that will tell you after the fact, but give me some people that will tell me, hey, you know what, I love you enough to tell you the truth, like my wife, my beautiful wife, Becky, who said, hey, when's it going to start? When's it going to happen? Those are the people that I want close to me. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll push those people away because we don't want to hear what they have to say. And we'll bring the people around us who make us feel good and make us feel special and don't want to tell us the truth. Hey, God said, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know, as your pastor, this is a part of my role. Part of my role is to shepherd the flock, is to care enough to tell you the truth about what's going on in your life. And we do that. I don't go around doing that like on, you know, on Fridays and Tuesdays. I do it right here from the, from the pulpit, from the Word of God. But as we preach the Bible and as we learn together, understand that God sometimes will send people into your life who are willing to speak the truth to you. I would encourage you, cherish those people. Love those people. Bless those people. Say thank you to those people who are willing to speak the truth into your life. And so Paul says here, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He uses an interesting term there. He says, he says who's put a spell on you? How is it that you went from following Jesus and, and following the gospel and believing the gospel, and now you're thinking about following the law and obeying the law? It's like you're under a spell. It's like you can't get away from this thing that you once did, that you think that the law is going to help you. He says, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. What is he saying there? He's saying that you have experienced the gospel. He's not saying that these people witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus, but he's saying that they have experienced the fact that it did happen through two ways. Number one, through receiving the gospel, and number two, through communion. When they, these believers took communion, the Lord's table, it was a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. They remembered his broken body. They remembered his sacrifice. They remembered the things that Jesus Christ did for them. That's what communion is. That's why we celebrate communion. Matter of fact, in the new year, we've got probably about five or six times, seven times, where we're going to be celebrating communion, remembering the Lord's broken body and shed blood for us. We do that. Why? It's a reminder that we could not save ourselves. It's a reminder that we couldn't pay the penalty for our sins and we didn't want to because that's eternity in hell. It's a reminder that Jesus Christ and his love and his grace went to the cross, put nails into his hands and to his feet, put a crown of thorns on his head and bled and died for us and then, praise God, three days later, rose again. It's a reminder that we need to embrace the gospel and say, Jesus, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that you didn't let me do it myself. Let me just figure it out myself. Let me follow the law because the law would lead me to hell, but the gospel leads me to heaven. It's a reminder. And Paul's saying, listen, what about those reminders? Those things that we do, communion, in the time that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, man, that changed your life. You received the Spirit of God in your heart, and now you want to try to walk with God and build a relationship with God, with religion, with works, with law. Why would you do that? You're being foolish. This is what he's telling him. Verse number three, it says, Are you so foolish? having begun by the Spirit, are now being perfected by the flesh. Now here he breaks it down. And I'll give you a couple of terms, some theological terms. There's salvation, we understand that, right? So when we come to Christ, and we don't know Jesus as our Savior, and we receive the gospel, and we are saved, that is salvation. We begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. But then he says, then, now, also, now you're you going to continue in the law, what is he saying there? He's talking about another word called sanctification. There's salvation and there's sanctification. Salvation is a moment. When I got saved November 19th, 1997, I was 14 years old, I prayed and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. That moment was the day of my salvation. From that moment on now, as I've walked with Christ, God has been sanctifying me and growing me and helping me to develop to be more like him. This is the life that he has for every believer. So if you've been saved, that moment was salvation, and now sanctification is happening in our lives. And you know, a lot of times God uses situations in our life to draw us closer to him. He does. You know, the reason why things happen to us in our life is not because God is mad at us or God is angry with us or because God doesn't love us. No, matter of fact, he loves us so much, he wants to grow us as close as he can to himself. And that's why sometimes things in our lives happen that we don't understand, we don't, we don't necessarily want to embrace, we don't know why, but we trust God, and in trusting God, we draw close 
to God. A lot of things have happened to you in your life that you would not choose or you would not want, but God is doing it for the reason to draw you close to him, to say, why don't you run to me? He's like a father. He wants his children to be close to himself, and so he will do what he needs to do to grow us in sanctification. But here's what was happening. These believers here, they got saved, they believed the gospel, and now they were trying to live the Christian life based upon a set of rules and a set of lists instead of in the same grace that saved them. This is religion. And so many times there's this battle between a relationship and religion. Many times in churches, religious things creep up where we get saved by the grace of God, we come to God the way we are, we're accepted by God for who we are, but then we think we have to follow this set of rules in order to continue to earn God's favor. That somehow, that God is only happy with us when we check all the boxes, we wear the right thing, we do the right thing, we say the right thing, we're in the right place at the right time, and if we do all these things and somehow God is more in love with us than if, if we didn't. That is so wrong. That is religion. That is false. And so many times churches teach and preach that that is the way to live. There are many churches and it's sad to say I love churches. I love uh, pastors but there are some pastors who will get up and take the Bible and kind of put it over here for a minute and share their preferences and share their things and share what they think and share their rules and churches are filled with guilt driven people who are so afraid to make a mistake in their life because if they don't check the box if they don't do it right way, if they don't follow this, if their dress isn't this and their shirt is not this, and says, then God's going to be mad at them, my friend. That is religion. That is wrong. God did not come to, to build robots. He did not come so you would follow some religious system. He came to set you free from religion. He came to set you free so you can have freedom in Jesus Christ, so you can grow as he allows you to grow. It's not a list. It's not rules. Take the list and rip it up. Take the rules and throw them in the trash can. Pick up the word of God and receive and discover the grace of God that he has for your life. That, that is where freedom comes in. That is what Paul was trying to tell these, these believers. That it is not religion. It is not your rules. Hey, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. We don't love him so that somehow we can garner his love back towards us. That is a transactional, shallow relationship. If all I ever did was, was say to you, hey, you know what? If you'll, if you'll uh, give money or if, man, if you'll buy me a coffee, then I'll be a really good pastor to you. That may work once, but that, that relationship is not going much deeper than that. If I build a transactional relationship with my kids, if my kids said, Dad, if you want a hug, I better see the Christmas list for next year. Right? Transactional. I don't want a transactional relationship with my kids. I don't want a transactional relationship with you. Then why do we try to have a transactional relationship with God? Because God is the one who sent his son, Jesus Christ, on this, uh, die on this cross, to die on this earth. I don't know what I'm saying right there. I just totally messed that up right there. I got it. I'm back. Here we go. God is the one who said, it's the first time I've ever messed up any time. I've been preaching for 15 years. That's the first time I've ever messed up right there. Feel blessed right there. It may not happen for another 15 years. Okay, no, I'm just joking. But God is the one who sent his own son to this earth to die on the cross to free us from religion from rules, from oppression, from guilt, from feeling bad. I'll tell you what, I pray that our, our church would always be a church filled with grace and with love and forgiveness. You say, well, yeah, there might be some people that come in. You know, we start reaching this community. There might be some people that come in. You know, they may look a little different than us. They may act a little different than us. They, you know, what if they like end up like, you know, what if they're like, smoking a cigarette out in the parking lot there? What if they're doing this? What if they're doing that? Hey, I'm just glad they can come. I'm glad they found the place. I'm just glad they're here. Hey, I'll play a seat. Hey, hey, once you're done with the cigarette, we got a, we got a seat for you right here. Why? Because it's not religion. It's, it's grace. I get excited. I gotta, I gotta back up a little bit because I get excited about this one right here. I get excited about this one. I'll tell you, we open those doors wide. I'll say this last thing I'll say about it. We open those doors wide. And whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come. Say, I'll, I'll come broken. Well, I'm messed up. That's okay. At least we know where to start. And we'll go from there. See, so many times churches, they open up the doors, and when someone walks in, that's where it ends for them. Oh, this is where you are? Yeah, okay. Why don't you come back when it's, you know, you're a little bit, no. For us, it's not where it ends, it's where it starts. And this is what the Bible teaches. The grace of God. That not only is God's grace for us and the gospel for us in salvation, 
but now it's also in sanctification. As you grow, as you learn, as you develop. Listen, I know you're not the mom that you want to be. I know you're not the dad that you think you should be. I know you think you can be a better uh, co-worker or you could be a better person in your life. I know that you, some of you look into 2021, January 1st, to be a better person. Can I say this? You can put a list of rules together and a list of goals together, and that's all good and fine, but it is the grace and gospel that's going to help you grow closer to Jesus Christ. There is freedom found in his grace. He says in verse number four, he says, did you suffer so many things in vain? If needed, it was in vain. Does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? He's asking these questions. He's saying to them, how is it that God saved you? How is it that God has guided you? Listen, you've suffered for the gospel. Man, you have, you have uh, put a lot on the line, and now you want to go back to works. And here's the question. Why would they want to go back to works? What was so in enticing about going back to works, going back to the law, being under guilt and oppression? What's so enticing about that? Because I would think they would embrace the freedom. You know what it is? Here's what it is. It's familiar. It's safe. It's comfortable. And so many times people miss out on experiencing the true gospel in their life. Oh, they experience it in salvation. But they don't experience the true gospel in their life and the grace of God in their life because they're too afraid to embrace it because they have to leave the comfort of religious rules. And they have to start embracing people that don't look like them, that don't act like them, that don't follow all the same rules that they do. And it's uncomfortable. It's like, you know, it's like your favorite, like, sweatshirt, right? Anybody have a favorite sweatshirt, okay, right? I don't know what your favorite sweatshirt looks like. I have a favorite sweatshirt, and uh, it's, 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 it's too big for me now. I, I bought it when I was a little bit bigger, and, but I love it, man. It's great. It just fits me just right, you know, and it's nice and comfortable. Some of you are talking about maybe some of a favorite robe or I don't know what you wear, whatever, favorite T-shirt or something, you know, and, your fav and you ever see someone with their favorite T-shirt, their favorite hoodie or their favorite uh, sweatshirt, and it's got like, it's like kind of faded, you know, and it's got like holes in it. You know, it's got some stains from, you know, uh, the hot dog, and they got, you know, a little mustard stain over here. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? Don't cover up your stain right now. If you wore your favorite sweatshirt to church, there's no judgment here, okay? I promise, all right? No judgment whatsoever. But I'll tell you, it, it, it's something about it when you get home from a long day of work, you know, and you, and you, get, you get kind of casual and you want to relax. What do you go, you go for? You go for that favorite pair of uh, pants or that favorite sweatshirt, right? It could even be dirty. And you're like, I don't care. It's my favorite one. Man, you pick up, oh, it's good enough for me. Right? You put it on. You walk around. Why? It's comfortable. Now, is it the best thing to wear? No. Is it the most attractive thing to wear? No. Is it the nicest thing to wear? No. Why do you wear it then? Because it's comfortable. Because it's what you're used to. And the reason why God, I believe, has led us to this passage and to this, this book of the Bible is because if we're not careful as a church, as God positions us for growth, as God allows us to reach more people and more people in the community, if we stay stuck in our religious comfort, if we stay stuck in our rules, if we stay stuck wearing our favorite t-shirt, when God wants to do a great work, he's going to be limited because we're not willing to leave the comfort to embrace the grace. And that's what Paul is saying here to these people. He's saying, how is it that you would do this? It was comfortable. It was what they knew. It's what they had control over. And Paul says to them, man, you're foolish. God came to set us free from all of that, from all the religious guilt, from all of the do's and don'ts, from all of the things that we think makes a good Christian. He says in verse number five, he says, does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Verse six, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So now he takes a moment and he says, now let me, let me bring somebody in. I think some of you will know, right? Abraham. Abraham was the father of the nation of Israel, right? The Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where God comes to Abraham and says, listen, I'm going to make of you a great nation, man. Your seed will be like the sand of the sea. God's going to raise up a great nation among you. And he says, listen, even 
Abraham, the guy where it all started, the guy who's the father of this, who would obey the law probably more than anybody, he said, wait a minute, I can't follow the law. I've got to believe God. And I'm telling you this morning that in your life, you may find yourself wrapped up in religion, but I'm telling you, there's a few of us in this room, I think there's more than just a few, but I think there's some people out there who've experienced the grace of God and the freedom that comes by, by embracing the gospel and letting go of religion, and it's wonderful. And I'll tell you, we don't have to follow the rules of God. We don't have to necessarily uh, check all the boxes. All we need to do is wake up every morning and say, God, I'm going to bask in your grace. I'm going to bask in your gospel. I'm going to allow your grace to lead me. I'm going to believe you that you will grow me and help me and sanctify me and draw me closer to you however you see fit. You see, when we embrace religion, then we follow the rules. When we embrace the gospel, then we trust God to grow us as he sees fit. And sometimes that's not always easy. Just like Abraham. He said, okay, I'm not going to follow the rules. I'll believe God. And he followed God. He said, well, where did God take him? God didn't tell him. He said, you go. I'll, I'll make you a great nation. You just go. Well, God, what are you doing in my life? Where should I go next? What should I do? He said, you just trust me. Can I say to you this morning that those, and I think many of you, all, almost all of you, all, I think all of you, I'll say all of you, that will embrace the gospel, will break away from religion, that will bask in the grace and discover the grace of God, can I tell you this? That God will lead you to places that you may not understand. And he's going to work in your life in ways maybe you wouldn't have chosen. And it's at those times that it's easier to go back to religion. It's easier to walk away and grab that old t-shirt and grab that old sweatshirt and put it back on and say, okay, I'm safe now. But God has a journey and a plan for you. And though we don't know what's ahead, here's what the Bible says. He says, to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to mourn and a time to weep. A time to run, a time to sleep, a time to, I think I made that one up, run. I don't think that's in there actually. I just kept, jumped in my mind right there. You check me later. He says there everything, there's a, there's a season and a time to every purpose. And I love what the Bible says. It says, he has made everything beautiful in his time. In his time. I don't know how God will guide your life as you embrace grace, but what I do know is that no matter what you face, no matter what you deal with, no matter the heartaches and the hurts and the trials that come into your life so that God can sanctify you, so he can draw you close, here's what I know. In time, you'll see the beauty in it because he makes all things beautiful in his time. So my encouragement to you is this. Forsake religious rules. Embrace the gospel and grace of God and allow God to lead you on a journey where one day you'll stand before him and say, God, thank you. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for growing me. Thank you for leading me. And thank you for making it all beautiful in your time and in your plan. Can we pray together? Lord, we love you.